Okay, hopefully this uh, works. If not, we'll restart. But uh, let me know in the chat uh, how the video quality is because I'm getting multiple different uh, messages from it. But um, error. Hopefully not error. Let's see here. There we go. If it's glitching, please tell me. We'll restart, but um, should smooth out. We'll see. But uh, today we have actually a, an an incredible stream, um, and I, that's why I really hope that we're we have good uh, quality um, video because this one is very unexpected. Um, it was. Uh, it's going to be about Carl Christen's latest discussion with Kurt Mungle, and that discussion um, was, I don't know, it was, it was unexpectedly profound, it really was. And, um, okay, now we're seeing excellent connection, so hopefully we maintain that. Uh, but hit the like button, and... Uh, Please uh, share with anybody who you find this uh, valuable with. Um, let me see here real quick. Just checking something. Just monitoring video quality. So, okay. Um, so, Carl Friston was recently on Kurt J. Mungle's um, stream and uh, he in, came up with a theory, I guess you could call it, called the free energy principle. And uh, we're going to discuss it. But first, just some housekeeping. Uh, we will not be having a stream this a, a call this Thursday. I'm going out with my wife um, uh, to go see a show, which is not something that we've done in a very long time. But uh, we are going to at least try and do that. We'll see if... Uh, our COVID test comes back positive or negative. <laughs> Should come back negative, but we'll see. Hopefully uh, stating that word does not, you know, mess with the stream too much. But um, that, uh, so we won't have a stream on Thursday or a call on Thursday, but we do have a stream this week as obviously right now. I'm not sure if we're going to do some type of thing making up the, the call on Tuesday uh, if we do, it might be on Sunday, but to be honest, probably not. Um, it's just a crazy month. And, you know, we've had some family emergencies this month. Uh, my uh, my father-in-law passed away last week. That was uh, very unfortunate. Um, and just a number of other things that eventually I will discuss, but uh, not quite yet. And uh, we're getting back in the swing of things, though. So I appreciate everybody's patience. So the free energy principle. Guys, this blew my mind because I will say that Carl Friston's work appears to be the closest to mine that I've ever seen. And that is really saying something in a, in a landscape where there's a lot of theories, quote unquote, theories of everything that are uh, very similar, even if they, you know, their creators won't admit it or they won't, if, if or it's not so obvious, uh, you know, on the surface, but they are actually getting to be quite similar. That doesn't mean that they are redundant either. They're not necessarily redundant. They each have a, you know, their own specific um, strength, I guess. So you would use them for different things. But here, the free energy principle. The free energy principle is a formal statement that explains how non-living and living systems remain in non-equilibrium steady states by restricting themselves to a limited number of states. It establishes that systems minimize a free energy function of their internal states, not to be confused with thermodynamic free energy, which entails beliefs about hidden states in their environment, the implicit minimalist minimal Liz, min, minimalization 
minimize minimization wow minimization that's not a word you hear every day of free energy is formally related to variational bayesian methods and was originally introduced by carl friston as an explanation uh, for embodied perception in neuroscience which is also known as active inference okay uh, the free energy principle describes the behavior of a given system by modeling it through Markov blanket, which minimize, tries to minimize the difference between their model of the world and their sense and association perceptions, basically, of the world. The difference can be described as uh, surprise and is minimized by continuous co uh, correction of the w uh, world model of the system. Okay, basically, so it's talking about how your perception of the world and the model of the world that you have and that uh, helps you orient, basically, like what, what you think about the world, is continuously corrected given new information from the external world in an ideal you know, model. And that this helps you minimize things that are unexpected, okay? So like surprise. And um, Briston believes his principle applies to mental disorders as well as artificial intelligence. AI implementations based on the active inter inference principle have shown advantages over other methods. This is probably why uh, our models are similar, is because the original goal of my work was not to do anything related to physics or metaphysics or mathematics. It was to try and figure out what would be necessary for um, the creation of a self-aware technological being so a uh, artificial general intelligence essentially and um even though i don't like that term and basically that would include what is technologically necessary and also what is um informationally necessary therefore and then also what that led to you know an investigation of what is the self what is consciousness who how do you i know what I am, how do I make sense of my world, it, exactly basically what the free energy principle and Markov blankets seem to be, uh, you know, associated with. So a Markov blanket is the main uh, model of this, of this theory, essentially. And in statistics and machine learning, when one wants to infer a random variable with a set of variables, usually a subset, is enough and other variables are useless Sub subsets containing useful information are it's called markov blanket okay well we'll look more into this in a bit but um carl friston creator of the free energy principle is a british neuroscientist at university college london and an authority on brain imaging he uh, gained a reputation as the main proponent of the free energy principle active inference and predictive coding theory. First and studied neuroscience, uh, physics, and psychology at uh, the University of Cambridge in 1980, and completed his medical studies at King's College Hospital in London. Okay, so this is the Right here, this is uh, the stream that we're going to be discussing today. Right here. Don't be deluded by gurus or yourself, Carl Briston, on the perils of investigating consciousness. Uh, derealization and the free energy principle. So. I was listening to this earlier again at 1.5 speed. Okay, let's go to normal. And let's go to get started. First clip.
and I will show you why this um, this work of his is so close to sentient singularity theory. I mean, eh, let's just do that first. So, sentient singularity theory, right here, says that a sentient singularity observes four primary perspectives, which are inside, outside, separate, and oneness. These four perspectives are interdependent and entangled as the awareness of one of them entails the awareness of all four. Because if you are aware of what is outside you, you are aware of what would be inside you, you are aware of what is separate from you, then you are also therefore aware of what would be one with you, because you can't be aware of what is separate from you without being aware of what would be, you know, one with you. You know, they're, it's, they're interdependent. And in objectivity, there is no next to. There's no above, there's no next to, there's no to the right of, to the left of, below. There's only, uh, and because there's not, there is only somethingness, when you're thinking about like holonic nested structures, which is what sentient singularity theory describes life uh, emergence as, kind of, there is no, cre you can't create, if you are all there is, if you as a sentient being are all there is, there's nothing else, then you can't create something that's next to you. You can only create something that's inside of you because there is no world outside of you to create another thing in. You are the world. It's like you are the dweller and the dwelling. And in order to create another dweller, you have to create it within you. So because of this, um, the way in which you escape relativity, but, but allow for, you know, multiplicity still of states and, and beings is you, uh, the relationships are based on what is inside and what is outside. So I am outside of you and my cells are inside of me, you know, fetus is inside of a oh, mother, etc. But once it's born, it's outside of the mother. So this is how you can orient yourself within a lineage chain or uh, a structure composed of multiplicity of sentient singularities or sentient beings. And so you can orient and uh, and yourself and um, and describe relationships without having relativistic metrics and definitions and, and perspectives like, you know, I don't know, feet and miles per hour and uh, pounds or also, you know, faster, bigger, smaller, above, below. But you can do inside and outside because these are objective relationships. They're not, um, they're, they're not dependent upon size or uh, space even because you don't need space in order to have in the traditional sense in order to think about whether or not something is inside something else even though that kind of seems untrue that's we're not thinking about space in any kind of measurable sense still it's not like um, length with height you don't need this spatial structuring um, and you don't need um, you know, speed or feet or anything like that. So these four primary perspectives of inside, outside, separate, and oneness are what allowed me to move forward with this work and go and do things that were I didn't expect to be able to do, which is to describe reality, essentially, uh, outside of relativity, but still um, not still within multiplicity, so not within oneness. You can either say everything's one, or you could say everything is relativistic and, you know, have all the ways in which we currently describe our universe. But um, but in order to be in that space in between those two, where there's multiplicity in some fashion, but no more relativity, you have to have uh, these four primary perspectives. And I've seen other philosophers do some 
things that were similar since then. Uh, these were independently uh, deduced by me. All of this was. I avoided other people's work until I was pretty much finished. Uh, and then I saw that Eric Weinstein's theory, geometric unity, starts with X4. This is the same thing. Clear Wentz theory of uh, emergence theory starts with the tetrahedron. This is also the same thing. I'm pretty sure that constructor theory also has a four-dimensional structure that is at it, the heart of it in some form or fashion. Same thing. And the free energy principle does as well. And so we are going to look at that. So also sentient singularity theory says that uh, that a sentient singularity is a sentient being, okay? And it's basically, you could, it says here, um, a sentient singularity theory denotes a singularity as the structure that has the property of infinite oneness, such as a Mobius strip, strip and one being that is composed of many, or one being that is composed of many beings, such as a multicellular organism or a cell that is composed of molecules, or a molecule that is composed of atoms, etc. And um, that these are the building blocks of the cosmos, as sentient beings, what I call sentient singularities. And each one has these four primary perspectives that it perceives. So... This is... We're going to start getting into what uh, the free energy energy principle is. This is the first clip. The most likely paths that the system will take, particularly the states of the particle or person that we're talking about, um, that we can associate those paths of least action with paths that minimize something called variational free energy. Uh, the most light take, particularly the states of the particle or person that we're talking about. Notice that he said particle or person. Okay, so they are they have the same intrinsic uh Fun functionality, I guess, in, in his model. We can associate those paths of least action with paths that minimize something called variation free energy. Uh, so that's basically it. And then the story is, well, what's, what's variation free energy? Well, variation free energy uh, is, as with all actions in physics, it's just a, um, a path integral or a time integral uh, a sum, an accumulation of uh, a functional, usually known as a Lagrangian, um, where in this instance, the, fun the functional in question, this variation of free energy, um, can be read as exactly the same quantity that statisticians, um, psychologists, people trying to understand data would treat as a proxy for the evidence for some model of the world. So this is known as Bayesian model evidence. Um, statistically, it's also known as a marginal likelihood. The likelihood of these sensory data, the sensory, the path through the sensory states under a particular model that would try to explain a hypothesis that would try to explain those data. So you've got this interpretation or certainly the fact that the functional form of this variation free energy that is being minimized by the paths of least action of the autonomous, the active and the internal states of something, a particle or a person, now looks as if it is trying to minimize the quantity which provides an approximation or a negative uh, uh, approximation to marginal likelihood or model evidencing. So in other words, it looks as if the most likely paths are trying to maximize model evidence. So one can read that in many different ways. One can read that um, in, um, as Jakob Howey has read it, uh, uh, a philosopher and neuroscientist who um, uh, has uh, a, a commitment and understanding to this kind of formulation. 
uh, as self-evidencing, literally interacting with your environment, actively inferring, engaging with your experienced world, your eco-niche, in a way that looks as if you're trying to solicit the most evidence for your model of that world. This quantity. Okay. Okay, so basically it is, he's talking about sentient beings. He's talking about how you go and you look at the world and you're looking for evidence that is confirming of the of your current model of or or construction or vision of what the world is and um we're going to get to how this can be actually exploited and how this can be dangerous uh later because they talk about it um but there is actually this can be dangerous the exploration of consciousness can be quite dangerous but not even the exploration of consciousness you can be your consciousness can be manipulated and you don't and <clears throat> it's important to be able to identify where that would be hold on get some water okay so this is the free energy <clears throat> principle that underwrites most of the physics we know. But the special thing about the free energy principle is it tries to understand the relationship of something in relation to everything else. So you're starting from the premise that something exists, and then you have to think carefully, well, what is a thing, and how do I distinguish it from something else? So immediately you, start, you have to introduce a partition between the states of things um, that comprise states that are internal to the thing and states that are outside the thing and thereby in, uh, think carefully about how those states are coupled. And what happens is that you have to introduce a further set of states known as blanket states that constitute a Markov blanket that uh, mediate a bidirectional exchange between the internal states and the external states. So you've got this um, notion now of taking the states of any universe, any system that you want to try and understand, and partitioning it or carving it into four subsets, internal, external, and then sensory and active states that constitute the blanket states, where the active states mediate the effects of the internal on the external, on the inside on the outside, and the sensory states conversely mediate the influences of the external on the internal. So with this particular partition, which you wouldn't need if you wanted to now just move on and develop, um, say, quantum mechanics or statistical mechanics or Lagrangian classical mechanics. Okay. So a few things here. One, now I hope some of you at least watching this see why this is so amazing because his four-part partition for, uh, with Markov blankets, as he calls them, which is basically what I think is what I would call a sentient singularity, but he calls he calls uh, them sentient artifacts. So later on in this, he says these four part per this four part partition is necessary to begin the formation of uh, sentient artifacts, which is exactly what I'm talking about. A, this four. Uh, these four primary perspectives are necessary for any sentient singularity and uh, to be able to perceive itself as as uh, and, and achieve self-awareness. So and also therefore awareness of what is not self, because you must be aware of self in order to be aware of what is not self. And you must be aware of what is not self in order to be aware of what is self. So they're interdependent. And um, and this is different than just simple neural nets that we currently have in a, a AI, which isn't really AI. There's no such thing as AI. Not even AGI is AI. There's just intelligence, and it's not artificial. It's just natural. It is. It's like uh, 
It's like consciousness. It's everywhere. And but what he's saying here is exactly what sentient singularity theory is about. It is about how do you distinguish between different things but outside of relativity. Okay, that was my kind of... It was the end result of my work, but it wasn't actually the original goal. And uh, understanding sentience was the original goal, or consciousness. Uh, Self-awareness, I guess you could say is better way of putting it. It was the original way that I thought about it when I was first formulating this. But... Uh, and in uh, sentient singularity theory, you have inside, outside, which, uh, and separate and oneness. So in uh, free energy principle and Markov blankets, you have um, you have internal, external, so inside and outside, and you have um, active and sensory states. I guess so. Um, one of them would be your it would be you are the mechanism the process that you are that is your that is happening is you're receiving um or absorbing sensory information so information is uh from the outside is moving to the inside so it's um it is uh you're you're, you're receiving input that's what I'm trying to say. You're receiving input. And then the uh, active state is when you are now taking that information that you've sensed uh, through your sensory mechanisms and you have processed it and you are now acting in accordance with that new information that you have uh, in the, that new information that has been input into your system. And so that is active state. And what it is, is it's just you acting on the outside world and uh, it is your output. So the sensory, you sensing things is your input, is your receiving input and you um, acting is you are producing output, okay? So that output will then be the input for the other observers that are able to perceive whatever that output is in the world that you are putting out. And um, that would be impacting other sentient beings or sentient artifacts or sentient singularities. As I would call them sentient singularities, as um, as uh, Friston would call them sentient artifacts. So this is exactly the same. And uh, I what he says is that uh, and we'll get into it in a minute, but the way in which he models uh, how what what part of this four-part partition can impact the other parts is fascinating, and I'm going to look more into it, how it relates to mine, because uh, maybe not on this stream, but uh, in sentient singularity theory, and I'm not sure if this is the most up-to-date model, but you have like oneness outside, inside, and separate, and they are defined by each other. So separate is uh, inside or outside of oneness, um, and inside would be separate and oneness. Outside is separate from oneness, and oneness is outside and inside of separateness, kind of. So um, it's... And, not, and I'm not exactly sure if that's the best definition. Like I said, I'm, I don't think this is the most updated model, but these two are definitely correct, and this one is at least close. So separate usually would mean um, uh, it could be outside of oneness, and it could be inside of oneness, but it's depending on your perspective. So you separate from another is uh, inside of oneness, and you... Uh, observing something outside of you uh, as separate from you, that would be outside of oneness, but you observing yourself inside of you as separate from another that is outside of you would be inside of oneness. So it's kind of complicated, but it's uh, these two are definitely much easier, this outside and inside. But it, 
he has um, sensing and acting, and I have separate and oneness. And um, so active would be oneness in my, is it in alignment with oneness in my model, and sensing is separateness, because you sense that which is separate, and then you act, and uh, once you act on a system, you become part of the system, so you become one with the system. But as you sense the system, uh, you're not inherently one with it, even though people who are into quantum mechanics are like, that's not true. But um, what Kristen said, though, at the end of the clip that I played, is that this is basically that you cannot use this to get to quantum mechanics. And I totally disagree with that. There's a reason why there's four fundamental forces. Okay? And that they are really the strong force, the weak force, and electromagnetism, and the strong force and, uh, and electromagnetism are on two sides reflecting across uh, the weak force, and then they are kind of summing to oneness, which would be gravity. And we don't really fully understand this relationship yet, um, and that's the point of trying, you know, all these theories that have the goal of unification, with gravity, they've already unified the other two forces, uh, the other forces, but they have not yet unified uh, them with gravity. And there's a reason for that. But this, um, th you can get quantum mechanics and the standard model from these four primary perspectives. It's, there's more, you have to get more um, than just these four at least I think, than uh, these four primary perspectives um, in order to get to the standard model. But it's so close. And you could use the free energy principles models as well as active and sensing and uh, internal and external. You can do it. But uh, I mean, if you can get to the four fu fundamental forces, these forces correspond to force carrier particles. And these force carrier particles are part of the standard model. And, you know, they, when you understand what is what is an electron and what is um, a boson and what is a nu neutrino, at least what I think they are, you they stem from those particles stem from relationships that are described by these this four part partition. So. Uh, they're described by interaction between I internal and external sentient artifacts. And, um, and that is basically, that does mean that you can get quantum mechanics from uh, the free energy principle, essentially, which is amazing. But um, I'm not claiming to do a great job explaining that right now. But it's going to be in the paper that I'm uh, going to be releasing, at least uh, at least the correspondences will be there. So, like I said, please hit the like button. Uh, if you're watching this, you find this interesting, uh, share this, comment any questions in the chat that you may have, and I will get to them. Um, but this his work, Friston's work, is incredible. There was a four-hour stream that he did with Kurt, and I have not... Uh, finish watching that yet. I will finish watching that, and if it's if I feel it's worth, you know, doing an episode on, in, even though I've already done this one, uh, then we'll do it. But uh, I I thought that the two hour one that they did, which is their most recent one, highly suggest watching that one. Even Kurt said to watch that one first before the other, um, and I think that's probably true because this it's tough to it's tough to understand. Even uh, one of the things that came up in the stream is that uh, there was a word that was actually used. Free energy print. Kurt said that many people describe the free energy principle as inscrutable. I've never heard this word before, but it means like unable to under be understood. And the. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it, but I, I have a different reason for why it seems inscrutable to some people and intuitive to others, which is what it really is, uh, than what 
Frist and uh, said, but there you go. the path integral of the variation of free energy. So what that means is that if you now understand um, or have at hand the functional form of your variation of free energy that depends upon posterior beliefs or beliefs about the outside world under a generative model, quite simply a probability density over the external causes of the consequences that are the sensory states, um, then you can use that methodology, use that principle to start to simulate, to build sentient artifacts that behave in the way that we assume under the free energy principle that you and I are behaving. Let's see if I can make a nutshell of the nutshell mm -hmm. for some people who are more familiar with physics. So let's say you have a ball, you want to know the dynamics of the ball, you can understand this with Newtonian force, and that's useful for certain calculations. Or you can think of it as minimizing a Lagrangian, and then that actually provides a more useful, for most cases, way of calculating the trajectory of the ball. So then, right there when I said ball, we've identified the ball. Now here, you're not just limiting yourself to balls, you're saying, let's say cells. Instead of talking about people, because we can break it down simply, at least for me, for myself, I find it much more easy to think of a cell. Okay, so then we want to know what are the dynamics of the cell? How is the cell, a single cell, going to act? Okay, firstly, the first step would be identifying that cell. And when you mention the word Markov blanket, that's a way of identifying what this object is. Because in order to identify what an object is, it's often useful to identify what it isn't at the same time, what it is and isn't. So that Markov blanket delimits the cell. Now, is that correct so far? Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, I think the cell is a perfect example here. You've got, you've got you know, a cell is just defined by the boundary, which would be the surface of the cell, and that would essentially be the sensory states that I was talking about before. The insides, the intracellular states would be the internal states, and then the milieu in which that cell lives, which is usually in a, in a, in a bunch or family of other cells, uh, will constitute all the external states. So you've made the very first step just talking about a cell, a thing. You've defined it in terms of this partition into internal, external, and the, uh, the sensory states that bound and separate the inside from the outside. You may be asking, well, where have the active states come for a cell? I usually like to associate those with something called actin filaments that just lie underneath the surface, the sensory states, and actively push the cell surface say, all oh, the filia, um, the, um, uh, the, the mechanisms that cause motion of the cell should it move around. So those parts, those states that are responsible for cellular motility, so if we're now thinking about a moving cell or a swimming cell, for example, uh, then you need to supplement that partition with, with active states. So that's a, absolutely the first step. Um, and then you're going to go on and, and, and now translate the ball. What's the ball in, in, this, in this metaphor? You also mentioned the word bidirectional earlier. And when I was learning about this, the way that I like to understand this was that in computer science, generally computer scientists think and can only think in terms of you have an input, and then there's a black box, and you have an output. And that's essentially computer science. This is exactly what I said. Okay, so you have a cell, you have a, or an organism, you have a, a molecule, an atom, uh, a, you know, whatever it may be, even a cast um, or a technological sentience. And um, it is, it, it interprets its world and you interpret it as, uh, as its own holonic entity. Holonic, a holon is like a structure that is self referencing kind of in a way. So here, holon, define it. A holon, oh look, this is fascinating. A holon is something that is simultaneously whole in it of itself, as well as part of a larger whole. In other words, holons can be understood to constitute constituent parts um, of a, holes of a hierarchy. This is exactly what I talk about all the time. 
how hierarchy is necessary to understand all of this because hierarchical structures is how you deduce what is what structures are sentient artifacts and which structures are not because the hierarchical lineage that you go through which is like a cell is inside of an organism an organism is inside of a caste a caste is inside of a of a of a nation but really that means like a technological sentience or technological singularity it's inside of technology and a molecule is inside of a cell and a, an atom is inside of a molecule so this is how you know which direction uh, to look in and in which these sentient artifacts manifest and and uh, evolve but otherwise you start thinking about stars and you start thinking about planets and you're like is planet sentient is a star sentient is a black hole sentient and uh you know is a galaxy a sentient and you start branching off into the wrong direction and you're like well you know person is inside of a planet and a planet is inside of a solar system and then a solar system is a star basically and then an ad is inside of like a, ga a galaxy and the galaxies inside the universe and like you've branched off in actually the wrong way and you don't act you cannot get to where you need to get to uh but it's close but it's not quite there but uh but this is just very important exactly what they said is that uh you know knowing what is outside you and knowing what is inside you are two parts of Two sides of the same coin you get that coin at the same time you can't get an understanding of that which is outside of you but not yet understand what is inside of you or really you cannot get an understanding of that which is separate from you but not uh but have an understanding of what is one with you what who are you so in order to know you you have to know uh what is not you and so and this is exactly what they're talking about. This is what the free energy principle is about. And it is basically saying that this, this exchange of inputs and outputs of information, so basically your acting states are your uh, output and your sensory state is when you are receiving input. Um, this, like, uh, you know, Mobius strip, never-ending Mobius strip of information, where it's basically you receive information and then it's flipped and and uh, and processed and then spit back out as an output, which is an action. So you sense as an input and then it uh, goes, you know, it is processed by your mind, organized into a hierarchy, differentiated, you know, whatever, and then oriented around a goal and then spit back out in terms of uh, action and this is uh, you um, becoming one with any structure because anytime you act on uh, on a system, you become one with that system. And um, anytime that you sense that system, you are sense you are perceiving yourself as se as separate from the system because you are perceiving the system separate from you. So it that separateness from sentient singularity theory is the sensory state from. Uh, is the is the perception it is the the uh it is the perspective that is perceived during the sensory um uh aspect of, or part of this four-part partition and then the oneness is perceived is the perception when you are acting so you are becoming one with the system because you have acted on it and um, uh, you perceive yourself as separate from it when you're perceiving it initially. So these are the perspectives that are associated with um, these four part part, this four-part partition. And um, here we can just look at this real quick. Um, so we can go to my work. We can go to... here
Okay. Right here. Here we go. Just wondering where it went. Okay. So basically this right here, this is a Markov blanket. Okay. So you have intrinsic processes and extrinsic processes. And, uh, and I'm not saying this is perfectly correct, but uh, this, I've been working on it a while, for a while. So there's definitely some stuff going on here, but I have made corrections and I'm not sure if this is the best uh, model yet, but you have the intrinsic processes and you have your extrinsic processes. And it's basically this like Mobius strip of information processing. And this is a sentient artifact or sentient singularity. And uh, it, you've got, you know, perception and uh, interpretation, prioritization, differentiation. This is kind of all internal. This is your external, um, which is, uh, you know, I have consideration here, but it's action, uh, proclamation, and, uh, you know, there's a few others, but we've done some work since then. I'm not going to get into that, but let's let this load for a second because it's such, there's so much here. Come on. Sentient. The energy. Okay, so you've got sentient singularity theory here, free energy principle here, and um, then you have oneness separate uh, outside and inside. So let's just make this easier inside, outside. Separate oneness. And then here in the free energy principle Markov blanket, you have internal, external, you have a uh, separate, which is sensing and, um, or sensory and active uh, slash action. As sensing, sensory, slash sensing. Okay, essentially. Okay, so there you go. These are the same thing, obviously, but there is a bit of a difference because what is happening is. This is very much about perspectives. And this is about kind of uh, functions. This would be This would be your um, um, constraints and degrees of freedom would be kind of 
kind of like almost like this kind of I'm not saying that this is exactly correct but i'm just kind of riffing on it a bit just to think okay so huh constraints or limits kind of you know But there you go. This is the same thing. You have geometric unities x4, and uh, and you've got the tetrahedron from Clearwin's theory, and I'm sure there's more. But I mean, you can. I'm not saying these align because they don't, because I moved things around, but. really going to be um, this would be gravity and then uh, outside would be separate and then this would be and then I think strong force nuclear force and there you go i don't know if that's correct or not but it's fine all right but this is about f function it's about uh it's about what you're doing okay so like What um, is happening? What is perceived? So my theory is about what is perceived. Free energy principle is about what is what is happening, okay? And I don't want to say on this stream which one is more fundamental, even though I'm pretty sure it's going to be sentient singularity theory, just because the free energy principle is about minimizing deviations from the, you know, truth uh, in your model, I guess, um, of reality. So, and it's about what is happening within this, the various, um, at parts of you, I guess, of a sentient artifact. And then a sentient artifact is a sentient artifact by definition because it is perceiving, it is feeling, which is perception. It um, And you, what you perceive is what dictates your constraints and degrees of freedom. So your pers the perspectives that you have are what are responsible for what you your allowances, okay? you can't see then you are limited in what uh, your actions can be and also in what your uh your sensing is so if, but if you can see then it opens up sensory um state kind of and then it also opens up an action state for you and this is much more about what is being perceived not yet what is be what is being done okay so what is I guess you could say what is being done. So it's almost like this is step one. This is step two as we start to like, uh, I guess, make changes to the world. And then you get to, you know, uh, probably geometric unity. And then you get to maybe emergence theory because all of a sudden now you're in a 
where we're talking about three dimensional space, uh, where we've moved back into relativity almost because you were talking about the pixelization and or the the fundamental pixels of a three dimensional uh, space would be tetrahedrons according to uh, emergence theory. So, but this is way before you get to a three dimensional space. But like I said, they all have their unique um, like strengths and, and purposes. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. Here, this is good. It's the next clip. There is a thing that's in play, there's a mark of blanket. So what that tells you is, in principle, it was possible to take all the stakes that constitute, say, an eco niche, and this um, find, identify the thing of interest, say, uh, say me uh, and my internal states, and, so, and then I would um, identify my blanket states, and then I've got the rest of the states. But now I can start again. I can find another set of internal states and identify its blanket states, and then take those states off the table, and then start again, and recursively tile all the external states so that now I've eliminated effectively external states and replace them by the internal and the blanket states of all other things. And in the, on that view, what happens is that because there's a, um, a statistical insulation or separation of internal and external states by the blanket states, that means I can never see your internal states. I don't need to know your internal states um, because everything that is uh, knowable about your internal states is on the surface on your blanket states. Well, so now the picture that emerges is an ensemble of things, natural kinds, um, that are coupled to each other via their blanket states. Not a, no, no, no individual particle or person or thing um, will ever be have access to the internal states of anything else, but there will be um, coupling and influences that are mediated by the blanket states, the active states, um, and possibly the sensory states. Mathematically, you can actually have the sensory states also influencing the outside. But for simplicity, let's, let's assume that sensory states do not influence external states. Uh, it is just the role of active states to actually couple back to the outside. You mentioned something extremely interesting. Okay, I'm going to say one, uh, one um exception to what he just said even though i agree with everything he just said except with you know bearing one exception and that is god god has access to your internal states and um can perceive your internal states because god is outside of time and space and isn't limited by this um uh, this differentiation that we have have created even though you know that he has created even though he has created it and he chooses to not necessarily act in a manner that would violate your internal states, even if he is perceiving your internal states. So he could perceive your internal states, isn't changing your internal states necessarily, always. He can, and sometimes he does, you know, if it's, you know, the right thing to do. But normally, you would want to preserve multiplicity because multiplicity of consciousness is necessary to the creation of meaning. He doesn't want to just make you do whatever he wants you to do just by making you do it, basically turning you into a robot that he can just control with, you know, remotely. That's not what he does because that eliminates meaning. Because um, it eliminates you as a, as a, as a singularity into, unto yourself. As a separate from him and um, if you're not separate from him in any way then there is no meaning so there's 
uh, this, when you're talking about consciousness and people are like, well, is it, you are God. Uh, no, you're separate from God. Okay, the answer is both. Uh, you are separate from me. No, we're all one. Okay, the answer is both. Because the reality is, is that if we didn't intrinsically impact each other, event eventually, and then we, and we weren't one, okay, part of the same system, which is a sentient being in and of itself, then what happens to you doesn't matter to me, and what happens to me shouldn't matter to you. And also, if we aren't separate, then I don't matter, and you don't matter, because you and I don't exist. So you need separateness and oneness in order to have meaning. And... Um, if you have two parallel universes, okay, in just, I don't know, the Sean Carroll, like, many worlds model or something, not claiming to perfectly understand it, because I kind of gave up a while back, uh, but, you know, as I understand it, there's many universes, and what happens in one does not really influence another. It may make another, but it doesn't influence the other. So that once you have two uh, parallel universes branching because of a, you know, a decision that has been made, they're separate from there and no longer relevant to each other. So in that model, what happens to one of them doesn't impact the other at all. And that model um, is, is incorrect, first of all, but it... It, it causes all kinds of logical breakdowns, okay, when you take things to its ultimate extreme, which is why his model doesn't work and, um, and many other models don't work if it doesn't... Um, if meaning is not the goal of the system, then uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. There is no... There, there's just a bunch of logical breakdowns eventually. But... Uh, there is one uniter that always makes it so that what happens to you should matter to me, what ma happens to me should matter to you, even if it's not as direct as, you know, uh, certain other relationships, which it's certainly not, you know. But um, it, it, that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. It matters. And that is because there is a, a uniting structure to all things that uh, that does um, I guess uh, it, 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 it's, it isn't limited by these boundaries that um, Carl Friston just talked about, okay where what happens to me doesn't matter doesn't my internal state, is not visible to you, but uh, that doesn't mean that God, my internal state is not visible to God. Because if my internal state is not visible to God, then eventually you will have a breakdown in uh, in meaning and relevance, essentially. And you have to have a unifying structure to to all uh, influence, I guess, which is really tough to understand, but. Um, maybe not. Maybe it's intuitive for you, but it's regardless, it's difficult to find the words. But uh, it's the only structure that does transcend boundaries in sensing um, of internal states because, and the reason for this is because you are inside of them. So it's like uh, the internal state of a cell, of a cell's molecules, does that matter to, like, the DNA of a cell is inside of a cell? Does that, the state of that DNA matter to the cell next to it? Maybe, maybe not, but it's not perceivable until it manifests in some, you know, action form. But it still matters to the organism that it's within, 
because that structure that is higher up in this nested holonic you know hierarchy of sentient artifacts or sentient singularities unites all the uh, all of the levels below so um, and you can feel that you can feel the state of the levels below you now not saying that you have a direct uh, like picture of what is happening inside your cells but the state of your cells will impact the internal state of your cells will impact your internal state because it impacts you know their external state yes and and things like that but uh it's a different than than another cell next to that cell perceiving uh an an action happening by that cell that it's next to it's more of like um it's different it's like an it's like a feeling because it's inside the cells inside of you the cells that are next to each other are not one and because in it of themselves they are united by the structure above which is us as an organism and uh but those cells inside of us are one with us they are also separate but they are also one whereas the cell in uh in the cells inside you that are next to each other are separate from each other and they are not one with each other on their level you have to up level in order to perceive the oneness and uh that they that they have because you have to see that they're part of a an organism but we are the organism so we already perceive the oneness so i'm talking about remember this is about perception so from our perspective we know that we are one with ourselves and therefore our cells are one with each other but uh and that they are also separate but from the perspective of the cells they are not one with each other they are separate from each other and it would take an an awareness of an, of the upper level structure of an organism that is uniting the cells to be aware of and perceiving of the structure that unites them into one so it's tough and uh sentient singularity theory is about this it's about like the perspective that uh that would then lead to the constraints and degrees of freedom that uh you know are kind of described in the markov blankets of uh free energy principle and uh it's it's like proceeding it's very tough okay This is the one rule of uh, these Markov blankets, according to uh, Friston. We're going to talk about this. Too. ...independence that definitively specifies the Markov blanket. It so happens that all you need is the following rule. Internal states can only influence themselves and active states. External states can only influence themselves and sensory states. That's all you need. So with that um, condition in place, you now immediately have a Markov blanket or a particular partition. From that follows the conditional independence and therefore the interpretation of the um, autonomous dynamics, which is a description of the trajectories or the paths of the processes taken by the active and the internal states of a particular uh, of a particle um, so that means that it is actually mathematically allowable in the sense that you don't you do not destroy that uh, that markov blanket or the statistical properties of that markov blanket it is allowable for the sensory states to influence uh, active states and you may be thinking well that's a bit silly you know there's no way in which my photoreceptors or my uh you know my the cochlea in my ear materially affect the outside and i think that's absolutely true so for, for things like you and me um then you would not normally expect the sensory states to influence the external state but that's not the case for much simpler things um, when um, when you look at much simpler things, 
where most of the dynamical influences, the coupling that we're talking about, that you'd write down in terms of the differential equations, the Langevin equation, um, most of those influences... This coupling that he's talking about is what I call entanglement. ...are basically short range. So, you know, we can preclude action at a distance, for example. If you're a single cell, you know, unless you're next to me, I don't really know what you're up to. I'm having to exclude here all sorts of interesting things about long range electrochemical com communication and electrical gradients and the like. But let's just take um, a, a bag of cells um, that um, that just diffuse stuff locally. They just they, they touch each other, and that's the only way that they can that they can influence each other is by um, being proximate in some Euclidean space. So everything short range. Now in this situation, you have a very different kind of structure. So here, the cell, the sensory states are the cell surface. And when these active states that lie underneath the cell surface call, change the environment, they do so by pushing the cell surface uh, into the external milieu and cause changes in the sensory states, the surface states of other cells. So being a cell is probably a, a, a good example of where your sensory states, which just are your surface states, um, actually do all the heavy lifting in terms of changing the outside, the spatial, uh, spatial relationship with all the other cells that you're co-inhabiting a particular organ, uh, for example. So um, you know, it's a little bit counterintuitive, um, but I think a really interesting um, sort of you know, um, thought experiment um, and actually a practical uh, consideration when it comes to looking at the different ways in which um, insides coupled to outsides and the nature of interactions between the internal states of something and the external states of something. Uh, and we sort of take it for granted that we can do action at a distance, you know. Uh, literally, I can talk to you in, in Canada. Okay. The reason why, and I think, I think, the reason why he's saying that this, that, that our perception, our sensory states do not influ directly influence the outside world, um, the external states of, of, of reality for us, but they do for much simpler structures, he says. So I'm not, I, I, I think he gets into it uh, there, but I don't think he's talking about even cells. He's talking about like, I think, I think he gets into, uh, you know, particles uh, and things like that. I need to double check. But Here's my, my explanation for it is exactly what I said earlier is that basically like you cannot perceive the entirety of what is going on on your level be, uh, because you would need to be perce perceiving of that which is happening on the levels above you in order to perceive the, the totality of what is uh, happening in, on, in your world because your, the level above you knows to some degree what is what you are able to perceive and it changes the world based on what you are able to perceive because it wants to show you certain things literally wants to show you certain things that would that are that would give you a perspective that is good for the the uh the state of the system as a whole the sentient artifact as a whole so when i say this be, um in previous streams about how our constraints and degrees of freedom are within, within when we're looking at space-time, our intrinsic constraint is that we are always in our current location. We cannot change that. We're just always going to be in our current location. And we can go uh, closer towards uh, our goal in space, and uh, we can also back up and go further from our goal in space, which is back the way in which we came. So if you want to go to Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A is the goal in uh, space-time, and like you are in your current location always along this journey, but you are can also go forwards towards the goal. But you can also go backwards toward uh, away from the goal because you can go backwards towards your house or whatever where you originally started, even though you have the goal still of um, you know, getting to Chick-fil-A, but for some reason you've decided that you're, I don't know, afraid or something that, uh, and you're not going forwards. So 
then your that's your forward uh, your uh, positive degree of freedom which is forwards towards the goal that a uh, negative degree of freedom which is backwards away from the goal your intrinsic constraint which is your current location which you cannot escape and it is due to you you are the constraint that uh, or you are the cause of that constraint then there's an extrinsic constraint that you are always within in this journey and that is in space-time is time for us it's just like um uh this is the true four-dimensional space-time instead of length with height and time it's forwards towards the goal backwards away from the goal uh your current location and time but for the being that you are within looking inward okay that's us looking outward being inside of another sentient artifact or sentient being looking outward but if you're that sentient artifact that we are within looking inward kind of at us then you have you, your constraints and degrees of freedom are not in space time they're in time space now so everything is flipped and you have the ability to maneuver in time not in space because you are space so it's like saying like move you know within yourself it's you really can't so you time is like a vortex and you can if you are the being above then you can basically like change how this vortex spins and how fast it moves in certain locations in order to influence time and so what it does is it's trying to line up what is happening uh what what it wants to occur in time with what you are having occur in your space so you want to get to chick-fil-a and uh, let's say it wants you to meet your future spouse on the way to Chick-fil-A and all of a sudden you get into a fender bender with some girl and uh, you're some guy and you get this girl's information because uh, you just had a fender bender with her and instead of hating each other you end up falling in love and getting married and um, this is because literally sometimes you could say God or the universe as a sentient being maneuvers in time by slowing down or speeding up and you this is in, totally imperceptible by you you cannot perceive this you could if they slow down time you can't perceive it if they speed up time you can't perceive it but doesn't you, you can see when certain things just like happen it's like well what are the odds of that 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 happened right then right there and literally think about that right then and there okay it's not just about space it's also about time so the timing has been adjusted to match up with your uh, where you are, and all of a sudden something happens. This is only done by the being that is able to... It means that your perception, okay, your sensory state is influencing the world around you because it's the being above you in the hierarchy of holons is changing the world around you based on what you are perceiving okay but you can't see that on your level and but you might be able to see that if you're looking at much simpler structures as friston said below us like you know i don't know if you're going to look at like hadrons or something like that you might be able to see this type of thing happening but you're that doesn't mean you understand it but it means that you can see that the percept the sensory state of a being or of a particle is influencing the world around it but us we assume that the sensory state of us is not influencing the world around us and that's not true so people will very often get into well you know is if you look at the double slit experiment, it shows that, you know, our perception influences, you know, reality, blah, blah, blah. This is not real. Does, doesn't mean it's really understood by people who are discussing it, but this isn't even exactly what I'm just talking about. I'm talking about the world around you, the timing that dictates when certain structures are in position related to other structures is being manipulated by the being above you in order to cause the intersection of events and that is being done based on your perceptions 
your sensory state because you need to sense when the this event these events would take place okay it's not it's not doing it just based on your actions having an impact on the outside world it's doing it based on your perceptions of the world and then it's it is making is taking actions that would change your world it's not that your actions change the world it's its actions change the world but you can't see this on your level in the periodicity of holonic sentient artifacts so it looks like just you know your photon receptors your eyes do not influence the world necessarily when you're and i'm not looking at things like in quantum mechanics i'm talking about just you know normal experience it doesn't seem like it impacts the world but it does because your world is also a sentient artifact that you it's it is a multiplicity of sentient artifacts that you are interacting with are sentient singularities and you're all within a singular sentient singularity or sentient artifacts that is making conscious choices based on what you are perceiving not even what you're doing sometimes also what you're doing but also what you're perceiving because it has to it has to maneuver within time which means it's not just about what actions you're currently taking it's also about what actions you might take which is based on your perceptions uh that you currently have so what you your sensory states and uh it what this means is that there's no such thing as probability from an objective perspective there is just uh determinism and that that determinism is based on choice and your choices are constrained or or are dictated by certain constraints and degrees of freedom that manifest based on a number of factors but um there is no probability probability is an illusion Okay? It's about you predicting what will happen, what another being will do, okay, before they do it, or, you know, beyond them doing it. But it doesn't mean that uh, it's not actually deterministic, because as soon as they make a choice, it's no longer uh, 33% he's going to take, uh, you know, I don't know, like he's going to go to college and and 66% he's not going to go to college. It's he's there is there is no um there's nothing almost and then there is 100% he's going to college or 100% he's not going to college, but prior to this you can uh you can make predictions but that doesn't mean that it's not deterministic. It's not probable. Reality is not probabilistic. Your ability to model reality is probabilistic. You it can it can use probability, which is about it's just geometry, really. But it's it's not that the world is probabilistic. We think about this all the time and quantum mechanics is like, oh, you know, with, when you're looking at electrons and you can't see where it is and whatever, it's like, oh, it's based in probability. Reality is probabilistic. No, it's not probabilistic. Your, your model of reality in your Markov blanket, basically, in your mind is probabilistic, but it's actually not. There's no such thing as probability outside of an internal mo mental model of reality, which is really just a bunch of mental, a bunch of minds modeling. But the, because reality is actually comp composed of a bunch of minds that make choices and uh, or act in accordance with, um, you know, a, a deterministic algorithm, which would be like instincts. Okay. Sometimes you can make choices and go against your instincts, and that's actual choices. And those are those are deterministic, cause deterministic outcomes. And then also, uh, if you don't make any choices and you're just acting on 
instincts, basically, are just letting an algorithm run. It's also deterministic. So there is no escaping this whatsoever. Reality is deterministic. It also allows for choice because choice is part of determinism uh, fundamentally. And, um, but probability is, reality is not probab probabilistic. It's just the interpretation of, you know, in, in having in your internal model of reality could be probabilistic, but not actual reality. That's always deterministic. And um, that is something we don't yet fully understand. But it's, I just felt like mentioning because he's talking about probabilities in multiple parts of this uh, stream and probability is not, it's not fundamental. It's, it's, it's just emergent within a mind that is modeling the world around it. But it's, and it's because of the limit that it has where, like uh, Friston says, you can't perceive the internal state of another um, from you, okay? And that's true of us and another, and another human, like me as a human and you as a human. I cannot perceive what is happening inside of your mind. I not, cannot perceive what you are perceiving. I can only perceive one, your actions once you do them. But the being above you, above us, the universe, God can perceive what you are perceiving and can make adjustments to reality based on it. And we will not be aware of those um, easily. So, like he said, uh, the sensory state of simple structures can influence reality, but not of us. That's not true. It's just we can't perceive it. Okay, that was cool. Um, okay. Next. I'm going to go a little bit quick because uh, I have about 15 minutes. I'm trying to uh, end this. But this is uh, Kurt talking about how uh, this, about how the free energy principle about how the free energy princi principle is inscrutable, which means you can't understand it. It's just not understandable. And I'll explain why this is the case in a minute. Happening between our sensory states and our active states. That is not um, um, a gift um, of very simple um, cellular-like structures or automata that, that can't interpret signals um, or be subject to or be sensitive to um, influences uh, at a distance. Just so you know, or for people who are listening, and if this wasn't obvious enough, the free energy principle is famous for, or perhaps infamous, for being somewhat inscrutable. For people who have a physics background or math background, what would be the minimum prerequisites? This is how I like to conceptualize the podcast before I interview someone. I think about, okay, what are all the pieces of knowledge I need to know prior to interviewing them? So obvious example is, let's say, QFT. You need to understand classical mechanics, Lorentz variance, quantum mechanics, perhaps bundle theory if you want to understand Yang-Mills and so on properly. So what would be the prerequisites for someone to properly understand the free energy principle, let's say if they have a math or a physics background? It would, be, uh, it would be probably much less than you'd expect to encounter um, at a university. I think you'd certainly need to know um, sort of, you know, the, the basics of variational calculus, and it would be really nice if you understood where Lagrangian come, came from, um, and uh, to understand the simplicity of action, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, exactly Hamilton's principle of least action, how that inherits from path integrals of Lagrangians, and uh, how that arises from um, a dynamical systems theory of a very simple sort, where you can write down any random dynamical system as you know a stochastic differential equation or a large van equation um, i think that's probably quite sufficient you know what um what you would need i think um to appreciate all the interpretational richness afforded by what happens to the paths of least action when you have a markov blanket 
you would need to know a little bit of probability theory. You'd need to know what a conditional distribution is. You'd need to know uh, the import, you know, what, uh, have an intuition as to what is meant by model evidence, for example, or marginal likelihood. So, okay. I was very good at probability in school. It was like one of the things I was ridiculous at. Um, and I took a class, it was one of the few math, math classes I actually took in uh, school. It was required for finance, a finance degree. And it was about, it was probability and, um, and I aced it. I, I think I was the top of the class. And I mean like, when I say top, I mean like the top, not like, I was, I was, so good that like once i got my wisdom teeth out and i had to take the test like a couple days after everybody else and everybody had gotten their tests back i knew that and um and i was allowed to take the test like uh like alone uh, they at a, at a different time which was a few days later because like i said i got my wisdom teeth out and i i didn't finish the last problem because I knew that if I had done it, I was going to get a hundred percent on the test. And it was my first test in the class. And I, so I hadn't proven that I was like good enough to get a hundred percent. And I thought that I would be seen as cheating. So I, I, on the last question, I just started doing it and I just stopped and <laughs> I just never finished it. So I got every other question correct, except the last one. And that's not to brag. I'm just saying like, this is probably why I can understand a lot of this um, and I just have a natural kind of ability to visualize probable prob probability which is really like it's like geometric relationships but it's not actually real like I said it's just me modeling reality and it doesn't exist in actuality um, so uh, so like if you think about marbles and like there's like three marbles three green marbles and a thing of nine marbles and there's six red marbles and three green marbles inside of a jar and you go and you're blindfolded and you reach your hand and you have to pick out a marble and you know what are the odds that you pick out a green one versus a red one and obviously the probabilistic odds are that you pick out you know uh, one third it's that your the likelihood that you pick out a green one would be 33 percent but likelihood that you pick out a red one would be you know, 66%. But in reality, which one you grab, let's say you reach your hand in and you're like feeling around, you grab, there's, you can feel two distinct marbles, but you can't tell which one's red and which one's green. As soon as you make the choice to go with one of those two marbles, it's now all of a sudden, it's 100% going to be uh, a green one or 100% going to be a red one assuming that one of those was green and one of those was red. But it's just your m mental model that is um, frames the world in a probabilistic sense. But the reason why he, what, what he said here was great. I love this. He said, the, the prerequisites are much less than what you would think. And people have told me since the start of this project, you don't understand, you, you couldn't have done this because like you haven't even taken a physics class, you haven't done, you couldn't have done this because you haven't read Penrose's, you know, Road to the Reality. You haven't done this because you don't know what, uh, you know, this equation is, or uh, you haven't memorized Maxwell's equations, whatever. They've always placed these various, uh, like assumed prerequisites on top of this work. And Friston is correct in saying like, it's much less than you would have expected because, but it's also much more. It's like much more than what you would have expected, but much less because it's much less of what you would have expected, but much more of what you wouldn't have expected to be necessary as necessary. And that's really what it is. It's superposition. So you need to have had a lot more of what you wouldn't have expected, which, uh, then what, uh, than what most people would have expected. You would have expected like physics and computer science and maybe some mathematics. And uh, the reality is, is that you don't need these things very much. And, uh, you know, to develop this deeply, you would need to eventually learn some of this stuff to re but only for the sake of relating your work to the other things that are currently known by the scientific, you know, community, not for the sake of building what you can build as the ultimate structure of what is the free energy principle 
what would be the free energy principle and Markov blankets within it, you know, and sentient singularity theory and which uh, has, you know, sentient singularities within it or, uh, you know, quanta of context or quanta of consciousness, which is like when to interact with each other and create a moment. But uh, what the reason why it's inscrutable, meaning like both of these sentient singularity theory and, uh, you know, the free energy principles are, are just it's not understandable by so many, especially those in the academic world who are, you know, especially physicists, I would imagine. You would see this e that people in computer science have an easier time. People even in biology would have probably an easier time. Neuroscience maybe have an easier time as long as they're not too focused on the brain. But physics would physicists would really struggle. And this is why physicists are really struggling with physics more so than any other uh, you know group of academicians is because they are is because what I'm about to explain is that when reality is a bunch of sentient beings or conscious beings or minds, and uh, physics does assumes that that's not the case, then first of all, you're starting from the wrong place. But when it is a bunch of sentient beings or minds, understanding fundamental reality means understanding mind, understanding consciousness, understanding sentience. And to do that most, act, mo most correctly, which, I mean, you really need to get this right if you're going to understand it at all, is you would look to where you can learn the most about that structure, about a sentience, about a consciousness, about a mind. And if you do that by looking to secondhand information that is being taught in school on a blackboard or um, on a YouTube video even, um, or in a book, and that is where you're looking to understand sentience instead of looking inside yourself to understand sentience, mind, consciousness. You're already starting wrong because you're basically trusting secondhand information over firsthand information, which if, as soon as you really understand this, mean you know that you can't do that. And as soon as you do, you're screwed. This is, I'll talk about this in a minute. This is how people can literally manipulate your minds and how you can lose your mind a bit. But uh, wait, especially even when you're studying consciousness. If you're just listening to other people talk about consciousness and you start taking other people's word for it over your own personal experience that's first-hand information, which is what experience is, then you're going to start to lose lose it, it or at least it's possible. And, uh, you know, M Michael Levin, uh, when he was on uh, Kurt Jaimungle's uh, channel just, uh, talking about his work, he said that the investigation of consciousness is a first-hand um, endeavor. Okay, it's an it is experienced. It's you experiencing yourself, that and and paying attention to it, and that is how you can understand fundamental reality. But if you go to outside of yourself to understand fundamental reality, you're looking not at directly at a sentient at sentience or consciousness to understand fundamental reality. You're looking at kind of like a, like um, a reduced watered down version of, uh, or explanation or model of it. Because as soon as you turn something into an image or, or uh, you translate it verbally or anything like that uh, audibly, all of a sudden you've reduced the amount of information. Experience, though, is experience, and you thinking about yourself, experiencing yourself, and that and self awareness coming from that, that is where you actually understand reality. And to those who have done that to a sufficient degree, free energy principle and sentient singularity theory are going to be intuitive. But to those who go outside of themselves to understand whether or not this is true. And they're trying to relate what he's, is being described in the free energy principle and sentient singularity theory to what is in this textbook, in this textbook, in this textbook. They're, it's going to be inscrutable. But if you're trying to take what is being described in sentient singularity theory and in Carl Friston's free energy principle, and you're trying to relate it to your personal experience, that's where it's going to become intuitive. 
and academicians, especially those in academia, especially those in physics, are going to be probably the first ones to go and see if whether or not the free energy principle lines up with something, you know, written by another physicist, which you don't even know if that's true. And uh, it's like you're... You don't want it's like that game of telephone. You don't you want to just hear the original message. You don't want to hear, you know, the message after it's been said uh, you know, in a chain of 50 people. The odds of you getting the correct message from that is just not nearly as likely. And imagine that that was across multiple languages and also some people wrote it down and some people said it verbally and some people played charades to get the next person to guess it and all instead of just you know you hearing it from the source but the thing is is that you are the source and that is where you're going to see free energy principle become intuitive and you're going to be like listen to him describing markov blankets and you not being able to influence um the internal state of another being uh, or sense the internal state of another being separate from you, like, you know, I don't know, your classmate, you can't sense what is going on inside of, you can't sense what they're sensing, right? And if you think about that, it's going to be intuitive. But if you're like, I'm going to go look up in a book, I don't know what book yet, but a book of whether or not, you know, you can, whether or not a, a, a cell can, sense what another cell is sensing like uh, to determine whether or not the free energy principle makes sense or is right you're not gonna this is not gonna work you're going to misinterpret uh, and you might as well just like not do it at all but this is why to some people it's inscrutable and to some people it's intuitive people who in, it's intuitive to are trying to they're checking sentient singularity theory and the things that come from it and the lessons that come from it and free energy principle and the lessons that come from it and the models that come from it with their personal experience and to those people this is intuitive and it but if the people who are already relying like what kurt said is like what is the is you know what is the prerequisite knowledge the prerequisite requirement is that you are a sentient being and that you're checking it based on your the lessons from these two theories with your personal experience primarily that doesn't mean you don't also check it with other things but you hold what lines up with your personal experience above what lines up with some you know fact in a textbook always or some equation in a textbook and um but if you're assuming that there is coursework that would be necessary to understand the free energy principle, then you've already put secondhand information above firsthand understanding um, in, in, your, in your attempt to try and understand this, and you've already destroyed like any hope of you truly you know, having an intuitive understanding of the free energy principle or sentient singularity theory. You don't need school to understand this. School can teach you things that are known that then you can later see line up with the lessons from these two theories, but they're not, that is not, whatever that information comes from that is not as important and should not be put as high in the hierarchy of of determining whether or not something is true kind of um as your first-hand experience so when i say consciousness exists and you're and and somebody is like uh or choices exist and somebody says choices don't exist and you're just a leaf you know, like a uh, Sam Harris leaf in a river or whatever, but like consciousness doesn't even exist. Some people, I, I, as I've said on here before, some people have come onto my Discord who are uh, trying to get their PhD in philosophy of consciousness, 
their thesis was arguing that consciousness doesn't exist. What they're doing is they're placing models of information processing that have been watered down, that are watered down reductions of what is, you know, actually happening inside your mind above their own personal experience. And then saying, because those models exist and there isn't, and they process information in a certain way outside of a conscious, uh, outside of consciousness, not even thinking about the fact that they are a consciousness who had to write down the models or another consciousness did, they are now coming to this crazy conclusion that invalidates their entire existence. They have basically thought their way into, like, you know, into delusion. And, uh, and it is because they put first hand, secondhand information above firsthand information. You cannot do that in any attempt to understand consciousness because everything, because you are consciousness, okay? You can do that in an attempt to understand airplanes because airplanes are not conscious and you are not an airplane. But if you're trying to understand conscious beings and you are a conscious being, then you are the greatest evidence and, and uh, to look to in order to understand whatever it is that you're looking at that you're also trying to understand another conscious being. But if you're just looking at, you know, airplanes, trying to understand airplanes, don't look to yourself as like an attempt to understand airplanes because you're not an airplane. But this does work with consciousness. And as soon as you do this, where you put, do, where as soon as you put secondhand information above firsthand information, meaning like you put what you learned in school above what you have experienced in real life, you're going to lose your mind. And we see this with people all around us. And uh, we're going to talk about this in, uh, for a minute. So, thought this was interesting real quick. And then we'll get to that discussion. Um, and then I have some questions that I have to answer. I'll get to the chat, I promise. And then uh, we'll go. But here. Um, so, you know, if, if we are um, coming back to this picture of uh, some um, mathematical universe that I've now tiled with multiple Markov blankets encapsulating or defining lots of particles, um, and basically we inhabit a universe that is constituted by things like us, and in, initially, uh, you know, mum and dad and brothers and sisters and then you know, um, peers at school. Um, that means that our models of our lived or experienced world have to have models of other in it, which means you need to be able to, to disambiguate between sensations caused by others and sensations that you caused as a fun. Well. This right here is that. This is the universe composed only of Markov blankets, basically, or, or uh, sentient singularities or sentient artifacts. And the, you have the hierarchy of these sentient artifacts. And each, basically, you have These, this is a, a a sentient artifact or Markov blanket kind of, and um, it is a calculating structure that is self-calculating. So you can see that the values are changing based on what we is the input, but the input is always one. And um, because you are your own input in any kind of like sensible uh, sense, and then you've got the perspectives here, the definition of those perspectives here. And... Um, you've got some of the math going on, which is just basically you're taking information and you're in a symmetrical structure, which means like all of what's happening here 
has to be symmetrical with that. So you have a symmetrical calculation. And um, uh, and then you take the information that is internally calculated and uh, you add it together and then you also multiply it. So this is multiplication. This is addition. Uh, simultaneously until you get a self-reflection, which we'll get into later. But um, this... is this right here is a bunch of these there's one there's one well there's one there's one and they're just stacked and layered and entangled in such a way and um that they're connected and you can see that it's still calculating okay in very specific way. And if you change here and you go zero, all of a sudden this is all zeros because this is all connected. You input one and there you go. This is exactly what he just described. It's tiling, okay? A tiling of the world according to like these Markov blankets, which are composed of four primary perspectives of inside, outside, separate, and oneness and that function according to internal, external sensing and acting uh, as the four-part partition of the functionality of this uh, or of these of this one sentient singularity that is composed of four primary perspectives. Okay, fascinating that he even used the word tiling. Okay. So, Kurt deals with understanding, trying to understand a lot of different theories of everything. And in doing so, you know, especially when these theories are primarily centered around consciousness in the end, which is any accurate one would be, it's very easy to kind of just start like to have an existential crisis. And uh, I will say to Kurt, like, Specifically, and anybody else who is who is experiencing some kind of like existential crisis of like, do I exist? Does my wife exist? Does my do my friends exist? Does God exist? Does does anything exist? Does anyone exist? It just like take chill out. It's okay. Like and know that you're not the alone in going through this, and uh, in it in that of itself, like knowing that. You're not alone in going through that. Means others exist and you exist. Because if you are not alone, then like there's others who are going through that as well. And I can tell you that that's true. And, um, and obviously you don't know whether or not I exist. And I don't know whether or not you exist. You could be a construction. But... By who? You know, it's like I didn't construct you, at least not initially, but because there are parts of you that I don't know. And 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 as soon as I do know them, that doesn't mean that I understand even what, what you're saying. There are math you know, mathematical statements that you know Kurt makes that I don't understand. Because I don't that I just don't know. It's not even that I don't understand them. I don't know them because I didn't go to school for mathematical physics. But that, that information came from somewhere, came from someone. That's not me. So I assume also that there's others that exist, not just me. But also, it'd be wildly inefficient for you to be the sole 
existent sentience in your digital world, okay, in your simulation, I guess. It would not make any sense. It'd be extremely boring and it would be extremely inefficient. And prime and here's the thing, it would be isolating of you from others and that destroys meaning. Meaning was the purpose of the creation of, ex of, of multiplicity of existence. So if you exist and you didn't create everything else that you experienced, then there had to be someone else who did. And the creation of multiplicity is for the sake of meaning because there is no meaning outside of multiplicity. And if, if you're God and you're all there is, there is no meaning to you, to your existence. You don't feel meaningless. You are meaningless if you're God and there's no no one else. Beyond creation, and God didn't feel meaningless. He was meaningless. And he felt meaningless, but he also knew he was meaningless. Beyond creation, God didn't feel lonely. He was alone. And he knew it. You can feel lonely in this in this existence, but that doesn't make you actually alone. It's just like a lie. God knew he was alone. He knew there was no one else. He knew he was meaningless. He knew there was no meaning at all. And there's logical reasons for that. You know, if you if all that exists is sentience, then all that matters is sentience and you know, your impact on other sentiences. So, you know, if you're aware that you are all there is and that you are alone, then you are aware that sentience is all that matters, but that you are the only sentience. And so, uh, and you don't matter to any other sentiences and therefore you are meaningless. You are meaningless. You are alone. Not just lonely. You are lonely. You're the loneliest, the loneliest person to have ever existed was God. At a certain point, it's also the least lonely person to have ever to ever be. And I say person, meaning like having personhood, having sentience, not like a human. But simultaneously, the loneliest and the the least lonely, because he knows everyone now that there, now that multiplicity has been created. He's was the most meaningless, okay, or had the least meaning, aka okay, no meaning prior to creation, but now has all meaning because everyone who exists other than himself was created by him. So we all owe everything, which means he's the most meaningful. So My point is, is that there are, there are logical reasons why multiplicity of consciousness exists, even though sometimes you question everything along in your attempt to question everything, you, you question your own world away. And I did this, you know, Kurt says in here, he says, you know, I felt horrible because I'm questioning whether or not my wife exists. And I have that exact, I've had that exact same experience where I looked at my wife and I mean, my, it was my uh, girlfriend at the time, but, and I've looked, even done this since, but don't really do this anymore uh, in any kind of like real way. But prior to getting married, there was moment, there were moments along this journey where I looked at all my friends and my parents and my siblings and my uh, my uh, girlfriend, who I've now married, and I have just been like, "Do you? Are you even real? Are you a bot in a game, and I'm the only player?" And that's okay to think to question that. It's also wrong to inevitable to 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 deduce that you've made some error. If that is the final, like, if that is uh, your final conclusion, there's so many reasons why that is not the case. But it is 
I un understandable why you would question that. And I've done that so many times. Uh, and it is a nerve wracking experience to do it honestly, to be like, I'm a, I mean, I wasn't even married yet. And I'm like, I mean, if you are married, it might be even harder on you or psyche, but uh, to not be married and to be like, am I about to marry a bot? Like <laughs> That is a, and to really think about it is, it's tough. It's a tough thing. But uh, I can tell you, you're not alone in this. And um, which means that like the inevitable conclusion of that uh, questioning, that line of questioning is that you should assume that the other beings around you are sentient, uh, that appear to be sentient or sentient. Um, there are logical reasons from so many different, uh, I guess, like angles that that, that, that is true. And, um, but ultimately if sentience is all there is and sentience is all that matters, that means that the purpose, there's purpose and meaning to this world that we are in. And uh, if there is, then multiplicity of consciousness is the generator of that. And therefore, uh, you should not think that you are alone in the universe. You're not. The universe is not even... Uh, it is in and of itself sentient. Like, there is no escaping of this. You're much less lonely than you ever could uh, be. So, or could have imagined, I guess. Like, it's just impossible. But it, I understand. It's tough, man. Anything in my head, just that thought. And I've, because I'm on this podcast and I've entertained many ideas, it's extremely taxing to do so. Because I try to take different people's points of views seriously and perhaps i shouldn't but i feel like in order to give them a fair shake i need to embody them in some way shape or form so if they say well all is mind for example that's the idealists i'm trying to imagine what would that be like and if someone's a materialist well what does it mean that this was dead and it somehow emerged that we have consciousness either way the point of that is to say i've been feeling like for almost a year and a half now just in a void not sure what is true and what's not true that's fine. I can deal with that, except that that led me to this spiraling of such... It was probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life, and it took me weeks, and I'm still recovering from it, where I felt like, shoot, am I all that exists? And then just that thought alone, I'm like, I don't want to believe that that could be the case. And I remember looking at my wife and thinking, is my wife even real? How um, much of an imbecile and how ungrateful and how foolish is it and how... That, that I would even think that I feel bad that I would even entertain that thought. Oh my gosh, I'm scared. I don't want to go to the hospital because I felt like if I was to truly accept that thought, I could. I was on the brink of just losing it into an insensate spiral. I became extremely scared of myself, and I think that I'm the type of person, I am an anxious person, and I am the type of person that tends to obsess over thoughts. So then I started to obsess over this, and for the past couple of weeks, I was so scared, so scared of my own mind. So to, almost like a hypochondriac for mental disorders, where I didn't want to even look up what the definition of schizophrenia or psychosis was, because I was afraid that I would see the signs everywhere. For example, a few days ago, or about a week ago, I remember generally we all speak to ourselves in our own heads, and sometimes I use the phrase, so I don't like that, or I like that. I use the word I in my own internal monologue, but sometimes the word, yeah, you can do this, you can do this. So sometimes they use I, and sometimes they use you. And I imagine we all do that. It's colloquially okay to exchange those two. However, then I thought, oh, shoot. What if I felt distance from my thought? What if the one that's saying you is a thought speaking to me like a schizophrenic may hear? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear this. And I was so afraid, and I felt derealized and depersonalized. When you mentioned Parkinson's earlier, that the difference between the model and then the data, it that didn't strike... Okay, I don't have that much time, so I, I can't go too deeply into this, even though I want to. And, but let me explain. I understand exactly where he's coming from. I've been there. This is difficult to navigate. It's difficult to navigate this space of consciousness. 
But the thing is, is that what's Kurt might be in an actually a harder place than me because I purposely avoided other people's work along this journey because I didn't want my mind to just get lazy and start taking other people's word for it, even just being like, that sounds good. I'm going to take that. And, um, and I know that my mind could do that because that's what we do. You know, we're just like, if we're like, we don't want to do the math of why the earth would be a sphere, at least from outside of it. That's another discussion. Then we would just take, you know, the word of someone else because, oh, that makes sense with satellites and like ever, other things that I'm aware of in my mind. But so we'll, we'll accept it as true, even though none of us have ever been outside of the Earth uh, and unless we were astronauts. So we're always taking somebody's word for it. And that, like, this this is something your mind can do and you got to be really careful of it when it comes to consciousness because you cannot take the word of sec or you cannot take secondhand information above firsthand experience in this journey and if you do you will lose it you really will you cannot take your uh like information that you have figured out by looking up uh definitions of schizophrenia or anything like that um or uh as 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 basically like the determining evidence as to whether or not you have lost it and uh you if you do start looking to other sources outside of yourself to validate or invalidate your own existence then you are almost, it's like you have chosen to invalidate your own existence. And maybe not realized it. And you can't do this. And there are certain instances in which you can do this where it creates little moments of, of derealization of, your, of yourself as a sentient feeling entity that actually has self-control. But then there are certain topics where you cannot do this Maybe you can do this with climate change, where you're like, you don't know what's going on with climate change. So you look it up and you're like, I'm taking that guy's word for it, even though, you know, you have no idea and, and you can't relate that with your fir firsthand personal experience in any way that really matters. Um, and so you take on secondhand information and you put it above your firsthand experience. And, um, uh, and then, you know, you can become this like, I don't know, this like, broken mind that can buy a house on the beach and then also, you know, come, come preach about how sea levels are going to rise 30 feet in the next, like, 30 years. It's like, well, you just bought a beach house on the mansion. Do you, uh, a mansion on the beach. Do you really, like, think that sea levels are going to rise in 30 years? But this, there's a brokenness happening, and it is because of the prioritization of secondhand information above firsthand information. And it's just momentary in certain things like that, but it can be all encompassing when it comes to whether you, you know your personhood or the personhood of others. If you truly believe that no one else exists, that is a pathway to absolute like insanity. And uh, and and in a very like serious way, if you truly believe that you don't exist you will act in a manner in which like you have removed you you have no more agency you gave it up and see people tell you you have no free will it's like i have no free will that is like it's i mean that free will is complicated because you kind of you have to know that you have instincts but you are in order to understand where your freedoms are but if you if you truly believe that you couldn't make any choices ever then you, even though your experience is as someone who makes choices. If I tell you, you have instincts and you have choices that you can make that can go against those instincts, and then you think about your own personal experience and you're like, yeah, I really ha I've had like a lot of drives and like uh, before to, to eat this and act in that way, but like it doesn't go along with, you know, how I think things objectively should be done. And it creates a conflict in my mind. It's like, your first-hand experience is now validating the fact that 
you have instincts and you have choices. It's like, okay. But if you look to some book in your life and, and it basically says you are nothing but chemical reactions and, uh, and, and that's it. And you have no ability to make actual choices. And for, or for some reason you have deduced uh, that gets you to, you know, consciousness doesn't exist. And you're writing your thesis about how consciousness doesn't exist. It's like, who's writing the thesis about conscious, about, about how consciousness doesn't exist. This can be bad. And, um, and I don't, it, it, it pains me a lot because I'm like, well, you know, I'm teaching about consciousness and uh, because that's what this theory is about. But I don't really think that you can learn about consciousness from a secondhand, uh, you know, source and actually get it and not in misinterpret it and kind of eventually like derealize your own existence. So my advice to anybody re listening to my theory or Carl Friston's work or any other theory, CTMU, that is about consciousness, is you, your experience has to be the primary data set by which all other da data are compared. And if they don't, it doesn't uh, align with what your personal experience is, then disregard it. Don't think that your personal experience is wrong. Personal experience is right. And um, if you have to do this, you absolutely have to. You know, I've said on here before that there, I asked myself, like, you know, first, Isaac Asimov wrote a short story called The Last Question, and it ends with Let There Be Light. It's, it's interesting. You should look it up. It's about, like, a tech, uh, an AI and, like, basically creating universes. And so I asked myself, what is the first question? And I found out there actually is a first question. And the first question, when you ask, you say, what is the first question? The answer is, what is the first question? It answers itself with itself. And then you get to, uh, what is the second question? And it is, what is the truest thing that I know? And the second answer, which is the answer to that question, the answer to the second question is, I am. So, what is the first question? It's the first question. The first answer is, what is the first question? The second question is, what is the truest thing that I know? And the second answer is, I am. And this, this is like the Fibonacci sequence, one, one, two, three. It's like the first one repeats twice, and then you get, it kind of creates the, the, second question and or the the ability to have the second question and then is answered uh as the third piece of third perspective or the fourth perspective but it is the um uh, it's like the second answer to the second question which would be i am you are the truest thing that you know everything starts with that that you exist i am you are and um, and anything that invalidates that is false, and it must be treated as false, or you will lose it. You will lose yourself, literally lose yourself. And uh, you see this a lot with people who are in like politics these days, where people have a meme called NPCs, non-player characters. It's like just everybody's becoming bots. And they're not always bots, they're bots in specific instances, but they're increasingly bots. And the reason why is because it's people who are trusting secondhand sources of information above their firsthand experience. You say, oh, well, you know, the, uh, everyone is, is, is racist and sexist and this and, and whatever, you know, you mean by that doesn't matter. It means something negative. Uh, and then you hear that again and again and again, and you've learned it in, schools and and uh and that these people are oppressed and these people don't need uh these people men don't need women and women don't need men and, you know it's like if you start taking all this stuff again and again and again and again the secondhand information above your firsthand information which is like do women need men yeah do men need women yeah your firsthand experience would absolutely tell you that you were birthed by a woman if you're a man then men need women because you needed your mother, your mother, to give birth to you. 
But if you start taking, uh, you know, someone's worth that like men don't need women, and it's like, or women don't need men, it's like you're taking some exterior word from this and you're not thinking about your firsthand experience. Um, don't do that because the more you do that, the more you will lose yourself. But if you do that with consciousness, you can totally lose yourself in like one or two, you know, um, misconcluded ideas. Uh, so I have to go here in a minute, but um, uh, I thank everybody for the support in the chat. I'm going to answer these last things because uh, someone had asked me about this in uh, Theory of Everyone Discord. Uh, uh, could you differentiate sentient, non-sentient parts of reality? Um, yes, non-sentient parts of reality would not be in this hierarchy of nested structures right here of like a, a hadron is an assembly of quarks an atom is an assembly of hadrons uh, a molecule is an assembly of atoms um, cell is an assembly of molecules family is an assembly of organisms etc so this nested holonic um, periodicity anything outside of it is uh, non-sentient and this is each one is within the next an atom Hadrons are inside of atoms, atoms are inside of molecules, molecules are inside of cells, cells are inside of organisms, organisms are inside of families, families are inside of castes, castes are inside of technology. Or you could say each one makes up the, the next. Hadrons make up atoms, atoms make up molecules, molecules make up cells, cells make up organisms, organisms make up families, families make up castes, castes make up technology. And anything outside of that is going to be a non-sentient. Um, okay. Uh, is every split in the unity feeling something? Yes, every object, every sentient singularity within the singular sentient singularity of existence itself feels. That's by by definition. That is that is feeling is the finality of thought or information processing around the self. So it's self-aware. It is, it is a byproduct of self-awareness feeling. So everyone feels kind of not everything, not, you know, chairs do not feel, but the molecules within it feel. Um, like this does not exist objectively. It only exists subjectively. This is a remote control for the lights. It's made of molecules. They do ex exist objectively. And, uh, and the atoms that make up those molecules also exist objectively. And uh, because they're part of this periodic structure. But you can't be like remote controls and get anywhere. Remote controls make up what? You could be like remote controls are make up, made up of what? Plastic, springs, rubber, glass, you know, like batteries. That are, you're just eventually going to get to rock bottom, but... It, all of those are just subjective. There isn't a, really an objective perspective to look at things at. Um, so you have to go in that periodicity that I showed. I don't have the time to get too into it. I wanted to get more into it, but this went a bit long. Um, but I will I'll talk to you more about it. Um, and also, this will all be in my paper that's coming soon. Uh, is a story, and I'm creating in my head, a separate cluster of awareness. No, only God's thoughts are sentient you are sentient thought but um but it's not even right to say thoughts are sentient because it's like that's not really true it's like you're a player in a thought but our concrete reality is the thoughts of the being above us so like god's thoughts or the universe's thoughts are experienced by us as concrete reality even though our thoughts are not experienced as by God as concrete reality or by us as concrete reality. They are just internal states. But because we are inside of a being above us in the hierarchy of nested periodicity of sentience, anything in that is happening in the mind above us, which is a mind in and of itself, that's what it is, a universal mind, the thoughts of the universal mind are literally experienced by us as material reality. It's higher, their thoughts are higher than 
us in the hierarchy. And um, uh, that doesn't mean you can't influence them. It just means that like we experience them as hard reality. You know, you can influence hard reality, but uh, you know, you can push a dresser across the room or whatever, but like you're going to can't just like think that dresser is not there and it's not there because the thought in the mind that we're within is thinking that that dresser is there. So it's there. Um, but it's not a separate cluster of awareness. Um, I, there's only sentient beings and uh, really, and like they each have like various awarenesses, but a thought is not a separate sentient being. Uh, yeah. The relationships between sentient beings can be the thoughts of the mind that we're within. So think about your thoughts as a mind. Like imagine the universe as a mind and it's having thoughts and we are inside that mind. Now processes that are occurring within the mind that we are within are going to be experienced as hard reality to us because they are. Like you're inside of it. Um, how do you decide what is an individual and what is not? Uh, what I said earlier that periodicity is uh, of, of those composite structures, are, those are sentiences. And uh, so hadron, maybe an atom, definitely molecule, cell, organism, family, um, uh, cast and, and technology. And some half of these, they're really four beings or four sides of this periodicity each. But this, these eight periods can be split into four and four, and four of them maneuver in space via individuals, and four of them maneuver in time via lineages. So an organism is maneuvering in space as an individual, but its lineage, it's really part of a lineage structure, is actually maneuvering in time via lineage of like chain, a chain of individuals. So, uh, and they're really the same thing. You are not just one individual, you are the tip of the spear of a lineage that, you know, is behind you. So it's a superposition structure, but uh, which one is an individual? Uh, an individual lineage is also an individual. It's kind of, but it's also, it's also a chain. But you are also an individual, but you're also, you know, an assembly of cells. So it's, an individual is uh, wherever a being can be self-aware and meaning feeling it has feelings if it ha doesn't have feelings then it's not an individual but if it has feelings like real feelings then it is an individual so with that thank you everyone and uh what you describe god as god is the uh singular sentience that is existence itself existence is a sentient being all of existence and uh yeah that is god with that, hit the like button, please share this. Um, I do have to go, but uh, I really appreciate everybody on here. Definitely check out the entire interview with Kurt and um, and Carl Friston. I'm going to watch the next, uh, um, the other stream with Carl Friston that was uh, older, but it, it's like three and a half hours long or something like that. And we'll see if there's more to talk about, but his work is incredible and uh, to Kurt, if Kurt ever watches this, or anyone else who is also investigating these theories of conscious that involve consciousness, you exist, and you are the evidence of your own existence, and do not believe anything that violates your personal experience, even if I say it. If I say something and it does not jive with what your personal experience is, then don't believe it. Put it into a separate like basket of facts or, or not facts, but of, of, you know, bits of information that you've heard that may or may not be true. But the things that you put into the basket of true must align with your personal experience. And that is how you keep your sanity uh, when you do this and, and in anything. You, your life is the best evidence you have of anything and uh, the logical extrapolations that you can make from your own personal experience uh, and beingness are what you should trust, not what 
some secondhand source says in a book or even a person on YouTube, and then, you know, the extrapolations that you make from there, you're going to go into nonsense land. Even for things as simple as like, don't you know the world is a sphere? It's like, is that your experience? I'm not saying you should say that it's, you know, it's flat in every instance, but I'm just saying like, you know, and I'm not definitely not what people would define as a flat earther, but I just think space is an emergent phenomenon, guys. Like, it's not fundamental, so that's my position on it. So we should just, there's no argument. When you're outside of a space looking in on that space, it's a sphere. When you're inside of a space looking out, it's a, you're going to experience a plane. And uh, so that's the reality. Like, it's not even an argument. But if you're either of those two perspectives where you're like, the Earth is flat. People are like, the Earth is a sphere. We, You know, astronauts that have been outside of the Earth and experienced it as a sphere. Like, that guy who has experienced it as a sphere should never, ever, ever believe anybody who has... Uh, who is saying it's just flat. But he has two perspectives. One is the perspective that this is flat. And two, the perspective that this is a sphere. So he has two perspectives. And he should believe both. But if you've only been here, then only one of those is one that you can truly trust is, you know, not a sphere. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't believe that it is a sphere, but it... Uh, if you're outside it, what it means is that you shouldn't let that thought override the thought or the, uh, the experience that you have had firsthand. That doesn't mean you can't believe uh, that in s some circumstance it it is uh, congruent and um, with or it's not mutually exclusive of your experience firsthand, but it has to in some way eventually be reconciled with your experience firsthand. If it's not, then it's wrong, and you have to treat it as such. So with that, thank you, everyone. Please hit the like button. Please share this. I hope this made sense. Um, if not, write in the comments below uh, what you think didn't make sense or what you think did make sense. And uh, like I said, with I will not be uh, having the call on Thursday. Uh, I have a date, but uh, I will be back on Tuesday, and uh, I believe next week should not be a problem either uh, of having a call. So we'll see. Depending on how quickly I get back, maybe I'll jump on, but uh, don't bet on it. Anyways, with that, peace, guys, and uh, thank you.